Good morning and welcome to the COVID Talk with Local Health Authorities. With me is Dr. David Purse, representing the City of Houston, Dr. Umer Shaw, representing Harris County. I'm Stephen Williams, Director of the Houston Health Department. This is sponsored by the Rotary Club of Houston and thank you to Kathy Finninger, past president of Rotary Club of Houston, to collecting these questions to actually put y'all on the spot a little bit. Let's start, <laughs> let's start with you, Umer. Please explain the huge one-day surge in reported COVID cases. Yeah, so first of all, great to see you guys again this morning. Um, so we've been, as you know, over the last, uh, well, actually several, several months, we've been having uh, issues around, uh, around the state with backlog and incomplete lab reporting, uh, inconsistent information. There's a lot of missing data points. So a few weeks ago, we made a decision that we were going to, as we had a big backlog that had come in, as we were processing it, that we felt that we were never going to be able to get ahead of this unless we actually work towards automation. Well, there's a good and a bad of automation. The good is that you automate. The bad is that you sometimes then add a lot more information to the case, and that's exactly what we did. These were, these were uh, older cases. Uh, what we did is we went through the process of actually determining uh, who we, uh, case-wise, who we needed to add to the dashboard, and then we had uh, uh, we thought it was going to be a two-phase, but it's actually going to be probably three batches. We did a batch last week, about 2,500 cases that were added, and then earlier this week, uh, over 13,000. Again, these were older cases of those 13,000, 340 of uh, one of those were actually within four, 14 days. So everything else was well beyond that. But what we did is we automated the system, so it's got backlogs that we went through, uh, inconsistent, inaccurate, missing information, all this data reconciliation, and we put that all together. Now, the, the other kind of semi-bad news is that we've got another batch coming, uh, but it won't be as big because we th we've gone through all of it. So okay. this has been a real issue throughout. It's just been data reconciliation. Okay. Uh, on vaccines, can monoclonal antibodies substitute for a vaccine? Wouldn't that be safer than a vaccine or using donated antibodies? So I, I did a little research on this uh, for last week, actually. And so the monoclonal antibodies are um, they're these tiny little antibodies, and they actually hit on the spike protein, mm -hmm. and that prevents it from being able to attach to a cell. Uh -huh. And they've been able to show that that works in a Petri dish. So uh, getting that into you know, uh, human trials and stuff, there's, there's a long way to go there. But those questions about would it be safer, would it be more effective, those are exactly the questions that will get answered. Okay. A recent survey showed 60% were not likely to get the first generation vaccine. I've heard 75% must be vaccinated to get herd immunity. Is that true? Uh, ha have we really determined that you can get herd immunity with COVID? Well, there are two ways of getting it. One is either just through the spread of the disease, the natural okay. way, and then the other would be through one. vaccine. And so, but you, the estimate that, and every virus has a different threshold when you get right. herd immunity. Uh -huh. We're estimating right now that it's going to be in the 70 plus percent range, mm -hmm. which is not uncommon. Um, but we'll have to wait, wait and see. Now, can you get it from uh, the vaccine? Well, that's the other question is, with this vaccine, if you get immunity, how long does your immunity last? Okay. We don't know that yet. Right. And I think the first part of the question was, would people hesitate to get the vaccine? And I think that, you know, again, it's got to be self. It's got to be it's got to be safe. It's got to be effective. And once you get those two criteria, then it's a matter of getting it out to people. Dr. Hassan Zarakit of American University of Beirut in Lebanon said mm -hmm. COVID-10 is here to stay and it will continue to cause outbreaks year-round until herd immunity is achieved. Therefore, the public will need to learn to live with it and continue practicing best prevention methods. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, we, we really are, uh, even if we get a vaccine, we're, we're not going to be saying to people, hey, guess what, you know, you got a vaccine, you're good to go. Uh, we're going to actually still, for at least the extended period of time in the near future, we're going to be recommending masks and, and, you know, all the preventive measures we've been talking about. Yeah, everything's a little bit relative, right? So uh, we have a basically eliminated smallpox. There's no wild smallpox anymore. Now there's in some laboratories. So we did a good job as, as human beings in eliminating smallpox. Uh, polio, 
We're not quite there yet, mm -hmm. right? But here in the United States, it's generally not an issue. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing will, will go with this. It's going to depend on if, if the vaccine gives you a long period of immunity and if a lot of people get it. We could basically make it not part of the equation, but if mm -hmm. we don't do that, it will be part of the equation. Yeah. Okay, the flu season peaks in January or February. Vaccine immunity lasts nine to 10 months. After all the years we've had flu vaccines, is this the longest and best protection possible? Well, well a couple of things. The flu vaccine doesn't always peak. I mean, it changes year to year, but actually, uh -huh. really flu season can begin as early as September. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've seen, I actually looked this up a couple of weeks ago, uh, we've had our peak here in Houston as early as October. In November, December, January, February is when it's more common, but we have had it early. So right. it's a little bit unpredictable as when it's going to peak and, from year to year. And it goes late sometimes. It'll go March, April, yeah. and, so, and even into linger, May. Right. Yeah. So it depends on the year. Yeah. But get year. your flu vaccine is the key message because that, get it now, because that should last you the entire year. Yeah, so to the one thing is we're going to hear people saying that because we're all wearing masks, that this is going to be a, a good flu year. It's not going to be a bad flu year. That might be true. But here's the deal. That is not a reason to not get vaccinated because the situation you do not want to find yourself in is to be ill with the flu and COVID at the same time. That's right. So you can do something to protect yourself from the flu, That's right. you know, with the vaccine mm -hmm. that you can't do. So uh, even though it, you're going to hear that prediction, that is not a reason to not get vaccinated for the flu. So the message is get your flu shot. Absolutely. That's okay. Right. Last week, the CDC weighed in on airborne transmission. Mm -hmm. By Monday, these guidelines were taken down as they said it was updated in error. Now tell us to now they tell us to use air purifiers to reduce airborne germs in indoor spaces. Does this sound logical? They're confusing everyone. Well, let me let me just make a general comment. And David, I know you you were looking at these the, the mm -hmm. filters and in indoor uh, with with HVACs at some point months ago. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the the general comment is. Look, there have been a lot of back and forths that have been occurring at that federal level, and unfortunately, this is where the, the political considerations have come with the CDC. And it's unfortunate because we know fantastic colleagues, all of us do, at the CDC. They do great work. They're very committed to public health. But this has now become political. And unfortunately, when, when you bring politics into a primary health and medical pandemic that should be fought with health and medical tools, that's the challenge. Right. I think you're right. I agree with you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us for our COVID talk with local health authorities. We'll be right back. Hey, that went quick. Watch, 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 Wash your hands for 20 seconds, just like Elmo. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Respond to the upcoming 2020 Census survey online, by phone, or by mail. A complete count of all Houstonians helps our city secure federal dollars for roads, schools, health care, housing, and disaster recovery. By answering just nine questions, your voice will help shape how Houston is represented by state and federal officials over the next 10 years. The census is easy and everyone counts. Your responses are safe and confidential. For more information, please visit 2020census.gov. We have to stay home. Not just to protect yourself, but to protect others. Stay at least six feet away from other people. Two, arm length. Just because you're at home doesn't mean that we can't be alone together. Together. 
of questions about the coronavirus. I'm here to share some simple steps you can take to help protect yourself and others. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Wash your hands often with soap and water for 20 plus seconds. Cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue. Clean and disinfect surfaces and objects. Wash hands after touching commonly used items. Together, we can help slow the spread. Welcome back to COVID-19 Talk with local health authorities. Uh, what is your reaction to the possible decrease from six feet to three feet distancing for deaths when schools open? Well, you know, David, I don't know your thoughts on this, but I would say that, um, you know, we've made the recommendation that it should be six feet, and that's been the physical social distance we've been re uh, describing. In fact, all of us have even now, right, in between mm -hmm. us. And, and the reason we do that is because from our standpoint, we believe that that is, your, that is the best guidance for what's going to keep safe. If you're going to, because of space reasons, you're going to go under three, uh, six feet to a, to a lower amount, then the recommendation is to actually have some additional barriers that are in place, whether it, there are splash guards or some other kind of, you know, respiratory barriers that actually prevent some, some interaction or spread of, of virus. Um, I will tell you that this has been a potential controversy that's been out there, but the CDC guidance says uh, when not feasible, do the following things in addition to that. And that's why we're really recommending, again, six feet is, is really the minimum. Yeah, if you, if you remember, the, the six feet comes from when, you know, the droplets spread, right? Mm -hmm. And so most people, if they, if they cough or something, the, the droplets will fall out of the air at about five, five and a half feet. So if you're six feet away, you should be outside of that range. And now we're wearing masks. And so the droplet should be less, right? Mm -hmm. But now there's also this issue of airborne. Mm -hmm. And so the bottom line is the more people you put into the same confined space, the higher the risk is of mm -hmm. airborne. And so while there's probably a concern that, you know, we want to get as many people into the room as we can for the schools in particular, whether it's five feet, four feet, three feet, the more you do that, the more you increase the risk that somebody's going to have their mask down mm -hmm. and you're going to have the traditional droplet spread or this new phenomenon of the aerosol um, you get more people in there, the airborne spread, you get more people in there, the more the chances there's going to be airborne spread. So, okay. so, so six feet. So, so six, six feet, feet yeah. if less than six feet, then additional precautions. But, but also, it, that's right, and that's what you said. But and then in addition, remember, it's just a question of population density. Mm -hmm. How many people per square foot, or you know, however you want to measure how many square feet per people, the smaller that number is, the greater the risk. So okay. if you go under six feet and don't have those precautions in place, masks that's, that's, are not in... Uh, you know, universally uh, worn consistently or properly, now you're increasing the risk mm -hmm. that you're going to have cases in that, in that setting. Right. Okay. Back when the pandemic started, everyone hoped the warm weather would help. We are now moving into fall, and I've heard the virus will remain active across seasons. Please comment. So I'll, I'll take that. So when we, we talk about one of the characteristics of a, of a pathogen, and the virus in this case, is what we call the r naught, the r zero. Mm -hmm. as opposed to the RT, mm -hmm. we can talk about that separate, but the r naught that is a characteristic of the virus. So that means that in, a, in an environment where nobody has any immunity and there are no precautions taking place, how many people can you expect one infected person to infect? Mm -hmm. So with this virus, it was, it's about 2.5 to 3 is where we think it is. That's the characteristic of this virus. But now we've got people that are wearing masks, we've got all this other thing. One of the things was the weather. So the weather seems to have brought it down from about 2.5, maybe down to 2, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's not a huge difference. What's going to happen, though, as we go into the fall is that the weather will get cool, so you're going to get that, the, uh, you know, whatever impact that the warm weather has that hurts the virus, that will go away. But what's more important, what should be more impactful, is that we'll be spending less time outdoors, more time indoors. And again, right just to what we got talking about just a moment ago, it's about, yeah. you know, <laughs> population density. density. And there's yeah. your problem. Yeah. Okay. Joshua Scharfstein, hmm. John Hopkins School of Public Health says they are finding the virus in more people of lower risk. What's changing? More people of lower risk? Yes. Um, I guess it depends on how he defines lower risk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah. It, well, right. I, I know Josh well, so I could chase that <laughs> comment down. I, I think what he may be referring to is that we were previously thinking that it was. Really, and again, the thought being that it's uh, those with higher risk of complications, elderly, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we're finding that other populations, in fact, it's a pandemic that ultimately all of us are susceptible mm -hmm. if our behaviors and our 
activities from the preventive standpoint are not uh, universal. Mm -hmm. And so just because you're a child doesn't mean you can't get infected. Just because you're an elder, a senior, you can't get infected. Just because you don't have diabetes doesn't mean you can't get infected. All of us can get infected. It's about our behaviors and how much exposure we have. But I'll track it down with them as well in Alaska. <laughs> if it's any different, come back and That's tell right, us. That's right, next week. <laughs> Question is, anybody can get it. That's right. And yeah, most yeah. people are asymptomatic. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Now that schools have been opening, what are you seeing? I saw contradictory information today. Uh, the, the paper was saying that it wasn't, the, uh, the, the case rate is not as high as they expect it. But then I, I, I saw something else that says that you're seeing more cases in, in, in Texas. Well, what I would say is that we're in not schools. seeing the yeah. continued decrease that we, with the slope, the decreasing slope that we have been seeing, mm -hmm. that seems to have leveled off right now, mm -hmm. right along with the, you know, just following the opening of schools. Now, we need to wait a little bit longer to see what happens. Is there a cause and effect there? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But remember with kids, um, you know, kids tend not to have symptoms, therefore they tend not to get tested. So it's not the kids that are going to pop up on the radar. It's going to be the, the adults that they secondarily infect, that, so there's going to be a greater lag. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Donald Marcus of Baylor warned that alternative therapies like herbal remedies and dietary supplements can compromise the health and safety of those who take them. Could they harm us if taken in moderation according to directions? I would say generally not. It's not going to harm you. But the key thing is to take them as directed and in moderation. Because remember, I remember one thing being taught in, in school, which was an aha moment for me, was that anything can be a poison. Uh -huh. Uh -huh depending on the dose. So, mm -hmm. you know, oxygen can be a poison. Water can be a poison if you get it in high, you know, and I don't, when I say water, I'm talking about drowning. I mean, there yeah. is actually a condition where people, they, they have this right. uncontrollable thirst. They just drink and drink and drink and drink. They thin out their blood and everything. So anything can be a poison in the wrong dose. Okay, if I test positive, what should I do while recuperating? I feel exercise is important. If I feel okay, but do not want to make things worse. Well, first is if you test positive, we want to make sure you stay away from others. I think that's the key message. And what you need to do in isolation away from others where, you know, you, you can potentially expose others is, is really going to be about your physical and your emotional health. It's a very difficult time. So whatever you can do to continue to take your vitamins, get sleep, and obviously eat and drink correctly, but also emotional and physical health that we would encourage. The only thing I would say is that it's, it's really good to always be in good health. Because once means, you get sick, it's not a time to say, oh, I need to get healthy now. Yeah, right. This is the time for me to exercise, yeah. <laughs> okay, to very quickly, do you feel that taking temperatures before entering buildings is helping or giving a false sense of safety? Yes or no? Well, I'll take that because we had quite the debate about that this week. So it is, a, it is another layer of protection, and it is beneficial. It is not the panacea. It is one of many things that we need to do to uh, help protect folks. You've been joining us for COVID Talk with local health authorities. We'll be right back. With coronavirus spreading, people at higher risk must take extra precautions. You are at higher risk if you're over 65 or if you have an underlying medical condition like heart disease, chronic lung disease, diabetes, or if your immune system is compromised for any reason. If you're at higher risk, stay six feet or two arm lengths away from others. Better yet, stay home if you can. The choices you make are critical. Please visit coronavirus.gov for more information. Learn to cough and sneeze with your pal, Grover. <laughs> Step one, realize you're about to sneeze. <laughs> Step two, move your elbow toward your nose and mouth. Step three, <laughs> Gazoon tight. 
One, two, three. <laughs> Remember to cough and sneeze into your arm or elbow and not your hands. Welcome back to COVID Talk with local health authorities. This is sponsored by the Rotary Club of Houston. Should we spray disinfectant into the toilet to contain bower aerosols before flushing? I've also heard it's important to open a window and turn on the exhaust fan. I don't know if that helps, but it won't hurt. Is there, in 2003, there was an outbreak of SARS in the building linked by sewage lines because of empty U-traps and drains. Should we be worried in an apartment or office building? So I would say probably not. I mean, you know, so that was then in that in that case, that building had lousy plumbing. The okay. the landlord had made all kinds of mistakes. So in a modern building with modern plumbing, with the U traps have got water in them, you're probably okay. Okay. Elevators. Should I walk or ride? It's always better to walk if you can because mm -hmm. you get exercise. But if you are going to be riding, make sure that you're there aren't too many people in there and there's physical distancing and you're wearing your masks. Got it. Research. What are we learning from other countries? who were ahead of us earlier in the year and are now experiencing another surge. Well, we're learning that uh, this is a squirrely virus and you can't let your guard down. So even if you get ahead of it, you may get behind. So very quickly, uh, we've got to keep our guard up all throughout until we're, we're past this pandemic. One study of hospitalized patients said nearly 90% of those experience at least one symptom, mostly fatigue and shortness of breath, two months after getting sick. Do we follow our release patients in Houston, should we be collecting this information? Well, so it's not reportable, so we don't, it's not mandated reporting like getting infected is, so we don't have it, but we are hearing from a lot of our colleagues who are tracking their own patients, and, and we're seeing the same thing. Uh -huh. Super spreaders, for some reason, carry a high viral load that they breathe into the air. Is there a way to find out if you're one? It might be a reason not to speak when near others. Yeah, it's hard to know. This is the problem. It's hard to know that who's a super spreader, who's a non-spreader, who's going to be asymptomatic, with symptoms, mild symptoms. You just don't know. So just wear the mask and just stay away from other people, especially if you have symptoms. And, and really, that's the best way to go. Assume but, you've got it. What determines the viral load in an individual person? Well, that's, you know, we don't know exactly. Okay. Um, and most of the tests are either positive or negative. They don't okay. give you a quantity. So. That's right. Uh -huh. <clears throat> it's, it's likely biology. Part of that is as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. One study said some asymptomatic people have abnormalities on their MRIs. Should all MRIs be checked, and if so, what should be looked for? So even with asymptomatic people, there have been some studies looking, at, and the one that I read when the MRI was looking at hearts. And so even some people were asymptomatic but were infected where they were showing some minor abnormalities in their heart muscles, scarring, basically. And so even if you're asymptomatic, it doesn't mean you're not suffering some uh, ill effect. Some trials are paused in the U.S. but not in the U.K. Is there a difference in trials protocol in different countries for the same drug, or are they all on the same page? Uh, there has not been as much global coordination on vaccines, uh, vaccine trials as, as has been in the past. It's a big challenge right now. Uh, so I would say that they're using different, but similar, but different protocols. And so that's one of the reasons that you have some changes in one country versus another. Is it important to prove the origin of COVID? Would there be a difference in how it's cured, treated, if it were inf from infected animals, escaped from labs, et cetera? I, I don't think so. We've got the, we've got the RNA sequence of it, so um, it may be helpful in preventing future new mm -hmm. viruses, but in terms of taking care of this one, we already got the information we need. Okay. Is there a higher bar of proof required for a disease to be officially considered to transmit through the air? So everything's relative. So we know that this virus, there is now evidence to suggest this does have aerosol spread or airborne spread. But it looks like it's droplet is still the predominant, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whereas with TB and measles, airborne is very common. Okay. FDA seems to be making rougher COVID vaccine standards. Dr. Hotez says it's very good for transparency. Will that extend the time to get a workable vaccine? What was the first that the FDA is doing what? The they're making rougher COVID vaccine standards. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, the thing is that uh, there's a lot we don't know about co uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, anytime we, we're going to safety, if, uh, effectiveness, and obviously standardization about, about what's going to be available, what's going to be out there is what is, is going to be welcome. So, yes, we're looking for that kind of guidance from the FDA. Uh, you've selected 420 <laughs> homes 
uh, for your antibody testing survey. How quickly do you anticipate the results? You've noted that many participants are hard hit neighborhoods. How is that random? The, the randomness was actually in, in, in the neighborhoods that were selected them, themselves. And we had to actually go to, we had to get a, a number of households that were in like a, 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 an identified block. And as the methodology for this study was a collaboration between Rice, uh, Baylor, UT, and of course our, our, our department. Mm -hmm. And they finished the study this past in, sat in the Saturday. Uh, so they're in the process of actually analyzing the results. We normally look at Australia to predict our flu season. There seem to be low on cases this year. Is that a bit of good news for us? A bit of good news, absolutely. We think it's because of uh, preventive measures like wearing masks, et cetera. But again, uh, things change across time. We have to keep our guard up John, and get your flu vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> I've already gotten mine. Two minutes. John Hopkins said uh, he thought the real toll is much higher in positives because of miscoding of some deaths prior to widespread testing. Have we gone back to make all those corrections? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, I think once, uh, so once somebody is buried, they're not going to exhume the body to test to see if it's COVID, so probably not. There's growing concern that temperature checks do not really do much to cure the spread of the virus. Since so many studies of really sick patients admitted to hospitals, only 30% had a fever. Yeah, it's still an important tool. You know, it's not, it's not as, as Dr. Purser always said, it's not foolproof, but it is an important tool to, to screen for temperature. Many studies show super spreaders with no symptoms are going to bars and restaurants. Your comments? Well, yeah. I mean, if they got no <laughs> symptoms, people are out, you know, doing things, and right. they don't know they're super spreaders. That's the whole problem. That's yeah, right. It's exactly the problem. One last question. Many reports say that the only way to find infected people and stop the spread is to use a rapid turnaround point of care testing for patrons. Do we have such a test, and how accurate and costly is it? We don't have a test that's perfect, mm -hmm. the, the closest test. Even the PCR test has got some mm -hmm. false positive, false negative. It's very small. Uh, the, the point of care tests have a higher false positive, false negative rate. Although the industry is doing better, that's and right. um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping that we'll have something that will be good enough soon enough. Yeah, we talked about this earlier with our health authorities that we do hope uh, in the future that we'll have point of care because everybody wants the test result immediately, mm -hmm. and you want it just to be accurate. In less than a minute, tell people what point of care is. Point of care is you go into a doctor's office or you go in somewhere and you get <clears throat> essentially a test done and you get the test result then and you can get care based on that test result right then while you're in the office or you're in that setting. And we did it. How, we, we answered all these questions. <laughs> yes, you did. We did rapid fire. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for our COVID-19 talk with local health authorities. With us was Dr. David Purse, representing the city of Houston. Dr. Umer Shaw, representing Harris County. I want to say thank you to past president mm -hmm. Kathy Finninger of the Rotary Club of Houston. I am Stephen Williams, director of the Houston Health Department. See you next week.